Welcome back. It is good to see you. I know Pastor and I have talked about how we've missed being here, we've missed seeing you. It's good to see your masked faces for now. I need you to do me a favor if you are here. I need you to look at that camera far over there and wave to people that are watching at home because we still have some people who are not home. Uh, we have Megan, we have Donna Green, Sharon Ryan, Lisa and Alex, Lori Brits. So say hi to them. Bless you folks. So you've seen some changes around here. I need to do a little bit of housekeeping. So first of all, you see that we have, we have cameras. And part of the reason is, is because when we came back, we wanted our online experience to be better for people who can't come. We didn't want them to be like, almost like a second class person. So we wanted to make sure that that service was engaging for them. So that's part of the reason you see all these cameras. The other thing is offering, we're not doing offering. So you can still do online giving, those are options. And then there's offering boxes in the back, which we've always had, but ushers will not be collecting offerings. Kids, there is no kids' classes right now. I will try to keep the kids engaged as well as possible. Vern, this is where you... Thank you. So we'll try to keep the kids engaged, which I think is gonna, it will work out really well. And this is a, a bigger piece. Exiting, we are all exiting out these doors. Okay? So the ushers will kind of dismiss you almost just section by section. We'll start with this section and then out. Once you're in the parking lot, whatever you want. Talk to people. We encourage you to social distance, but however that looks out there, that's a great way to spend time together. Singing with the mask on is challenging. I'm just saying, singing with a mask on is challenging. So be careful. If you've not sung or you've not worked out with a mask on recently, it's gonna be a little taxing. So take some breaks. Like I said before, we don't want anyone passing out. There's hand sanitizer all over. Use it, wash your hands, just do those normal things. We are not here to police you. That is not our goal. Our goal is to make a safe environment for people to come worship God. That is it. One of the things that we believe is that this is temporary. And as soon as we can get rid of these restrictions and these changes and get back to normal worship, we will do that. We will work in that direction as soon as we can. Let's stand together, church. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this time together. God, we thank you that we are together again as the body. God, we pray that as we enter in, that we do so actively, God. Regardless of the masks and all the changes, God, we just pray, God, that we enter into your presence. God, we are inviting you here. We are expecting in worship this morning, God. God, I come against fear. I come against apprehension in Jesus' name. We give this service to you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, even though we've been apart, we're still the church. No one's going to argue that. But when we are together, it is special. It is good to gather together. It's a little different because of the spacing. I'm going to encourage you that if you want to, you can expand your worship capabilities. I kind of told the first service, if you're here, you can kind of branch out a little bit to here if you want. There should be room. But more than that, I want to encourage you to engage in worship. It's not the same as worshiping at home. Worshiping together is different. So I encourage you, take steps into worship. You've been wanting this because you've been watching this online. Becca, will you lead us? Yes. Oh, so good to see people. <laughs> it's been a long couple of months recording to ourselves with just a camera. So it's so good to see people out there. So excited to worship with you guys. So let's all join in and worship together this morning.
Psalm 55. Listen to my prayer, O God. Do not ignore my plea. Hear me and answer me. My thoughts trouble me and I am distraught. That's verse 1, verse 2. And then in verse 16, and this has been on my, on my heart and on my mind for a while, it says, it says this, it says, As for me, I call to God, and the Lord saves me. And then we go down to verse 22, and it says, Cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. And then the writer ends this chapter of 55, and says, But as for me, I trust in you. Does anyone need prayer? I'm going to have you raise your hand. So we're not going to do body ministry, but if you need something on your heart, just raise your hand. And I'm going to have you look around and see who needs prayer. Just go ahead and turn around, look. Okay. So once you see someone, I want you to ask, I'm going to ask you to pray for them. Let's pray together. God, we come before you and we stand on that scripture, God. That if we cast our cares on you, that you will take care of us, God. God, we don't have empty words, but we have someone that we're speaking to. In the name of Jesus, I speak against sickness. I speak against disease. I speak against addictions. I speak against fear. God, I pray that those hands that are lifted up, that you move on behalf of them, God. God, we pray for people that are watching online that have burdens, that have things that are plaguing them. We pray for them in Jesus' name, God. God, as we look into your word, I pray that you'll speak through me, that the words that I speak are directed by you. We thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, you may be seated. So this is normally where we would put some fun music on and you'd run around and greet each other. So we're not going to put fun music on, but I'm going to have you turn around and say hi to someone. Good morning. I'm going to ask the creative team to stand up. We need, this is a, a thank you that is in order. So if you were on that team over the last few months, I'm going to have you stand up. You know who you are. All right, so everyone in the back is standing as well. They're just busy. So this is the group of people that worked very hard to make sure that there was something either on Facebook or YouTube for you to watch on Sundays for the last two months. We're not going to count the hours at this point. We're just going to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Right, Ian? Yes. Ian was editor-in-chief, so he had a lot, of, a lot of things to do. We are starting our series 2020 Life Disrupted this morning, and I want you to think back I want you to take a few steps back and think about March of 2020. 
I want you to think of what you were doing in March of 2020, maybe around the 23rd, 24th, or 25th, and how your life changed after that. You've heard the same stories that I've heard. You've listened to stories. You've read stories. Life has definitely been disrupted. The first half of 2020 was not like anything we would have planned. I have a definition of a disruption, and it's this. It's a disturbance or problems which interrupt an event, activity, or process our lives. This one's a little simpler, and it is this one. Oops. This one. Disturbance or problems which interrupt an uh, an event, activity, or process. Sorry, i got to fade out and then fade back in. It's an interruption of the normal state. When we're going along and then something happens. Disruptions can be good or they can be bad. Some of our lives were disrupted because we ran into the right person at the right time and got married. Right? That's a disrupted state. It changed. It's an interruption of the normal state. Sometimes our computers run in disrupted states. You're trying to do something, and all of a sudden, it starts spinning. You get that pinwheel, or you clicked on something you probably shouldn't have. An email from Pastor Vern that has just a link in it, or from myself that has just a link in it. Don't click on those things. I'm not going to send you a link. Those are called viruses, and they're just waiting for you. But that disrupts the operating system of that computer and maybe the rest of your day. Or it can be something simple. Like the the button that has the thread that starts to hang out and you kind of pull that, right? And then then by the time you're done, it's on the ground. That shirt is now disrupted. Closer to home, we had a disruption in Midland, right? When the, the dam broke. Lives were changed. Changed for probably a very long time. Personally, I want to talk about a few disruptions that happened in my life. And this was early in March. And this is what they look like. And this all happened within a couple days. I closed my office. I stopped seeing patients. Called about 100 patients up, me and my team, and said, we're going to cancel you for this week, and we don't know when we'll be back, and we're not sure what reopening looks like. We decided to move a school that I'm involved to fully online. So we went from classrooms to online in a matter of days, canceled a ton of different things, events. And then we transitioned... Life in Christ Fellowship, entirely online. All those things happened in a few days. I was pretty disrupted. I was walking around and I was sighing a lot. Whenever I sigh a lot, Sarah's like, are you okay? I'm like, yeah. Yeah, I'm okay. I was disrupted. Disruptions are not abnormal. We can almost expect them, but the magnitude of this disruption is different. So the recovery will be transforming, I believe. You see, disruptions have the potential for growth. Disruptions have the potential for growth. Remember that. Let's break this down a little bit with this scale. Normally, our body tries to find a spot where things are kind of even. Those of you who are in biology or been through biology, homeostasis, right? It is the word we know. It's the word we love. When your body is in homeostasis, everything is working pretty good. However, we are balancing the stress of life and then just trying to maintain. So some fun, some life. And it tips back and forth throughout the days. But the goal is that those kind of balance each other out. We strive for balance. We strive for that. Because being in a disrupted state, it's not fun. It's not. I don't walk around sighing because I was having fun. I mean, I might not be the most fun person you've ever hung out with, but sighing is not really the way I roll. Turn to Genesis, chapter 37. Genesis, chapter 37, story about Joseph. Kids, what do we know about Joseph? Go ahead. 17 years old when this story happened. I love the memory. Good job. 
the benefits of coming to the 9 o'clock service. You know all the answers. What else do we know about Joseph? Jen? He had a colorful coat. Favorite colors over there are pink and purple. Am I correct? Pink, pur- pink and purple. What else do we know about Joseph, kids? Anything else? He had a bunch of brothers. He had a, yeah, he had a bunch of brothers. What else? He was a favorite of his father. So his dad had a favorite. Parents, not a good thing. Kids, it's not a good thing. And you're all thinking, I wish I was the favorite. (laughs) All right, let's get into the word. This poor kid's 17-year-old's life gets disrupted. So verse 12, we're going to start at, Now his brothers had gone from graze, to, gone to graze at their father's flock near Shechem. Now Shechem was a place where it was very worldly, but there was water there. So that was the benefit of going there. And Israel said to Joseph, As you know, your brothers are grazing at the flocks near Shechem. Come, I am going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. He's being obedient. Verse 14, So he said to him, Go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks, and bring back word to me. Tell me what's going on. Then he sent him off from the valley of Hebron. When Joseph arrived at Shechem, a man found him wandering around the fields and asked him, what are you looking for? He replied, I'm looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where they are grazing their flocks? They had moved on from here. The man answered, I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So he's looking for his brothers. He's kind of just chasing them down a little bit. So Joseph went after his brothers and he finally sees them. And he saw them in the distance. But before he reached them, His brothers, these good people in his life, what did they do? They plotted to kill him. Sounds like a disruption coming his way, right? Even in verse 19, they say, here comes the dreamer. That's one thing we didn't mention is that Joseph had some pretty pretty good dreams. And he would tell his brothers, and he looked pretty good in his dreams. But they said, here comes the dreamer. Verse 20, come now, let's kill him and throw him into a well. And say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. A little bit bitter, okay? So they're going to kill him, and they're going to lie. That's their plan right now. And then verse 21, when Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. So he's trying to intervene. He said, let's not take his life. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into this well here in the wilderness. So let's just put him into the well in the wilderness. But don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue, rescue him from them and then take him back to his father. So he thought at that point that we're going to kind of hide him in the well. He was going to kind of come back later, help him out, and bring him back to his father. So he was going to save his life. 23. So Joseph came to his brothers. They stripped him of his robe. So this coat of many colors, they took it off him. And they took him and threw him into the cistern or the well. It was empty. There was no water in it. What a shock, right? So poor guy's looking for his brother, and then this happens. It says, as they sat down to eat their, eat their meal, they looked and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming to Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm, and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? He's saying, If we just kill him, we don't get anything out of it. So let's do this. Let's sell him to the Ishmaelites, which is this verse here. It says, come, let's let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother and our own flesh and blood. All this is is one big disruption in his life. So he went from someone who was the favorite, who had options in life, to someone who was now in a well with no options. So this is where we're going to pause the story for this week. We're in the middle of a disruption. And how old is this Joseph Tess? He's 17 year old, in a well, by his brothers. Sold to his second cousins into slavery. Disruption, definitely. Change, definitely. A few things happen because of this that come out of it. The first thing is Joseph moved from a a place of doing quite well to a place of being in slavery. 
Like I said, his position changed. He went from favored with options to unfavored with no options. The next thing is that his father grieved him for the next 22 years. And because our decisions often impact other people, his brothers lived with this guilt for 22 years. That feeling that they knew they shouldn't have done that, but they did it anyway. Just like Joseph, we have disruptions in our life. And we've talked about a few of them already. I talked about mine. We took a survey from Life in Christ a while ago. And we're going to talk about some of our disruptions as a church family, as well as how we've grown. So if I could have two volunteers. Actually, I just need one volunteer because I promised Tessa she could do this. Tess, come on up. Is there another volunteer? Lee? Perfect. All right, which side do you want? You good on the green side? Blue, okay. Lee, I'm going to have you come over, over onto that side for me, please. You're good here, Tess. Okay, so we have uh, green. Whoops. We have to switch these. I'm going to switch you two. I'm so sorry. Okay. Are you okay with green? All right. So what's going to happen is I'm going to read something, and we're going to start with you, Lee. And as I read the, the line, you are just going to take one of those life moments, and they are painted blue, just so you know, because blue is the color of 2020, and I have affectionately named that pandemic blue. So it'll go right in there, okay? And then Tessa, because it's growth area, it's going to be green. But we're going to start with Lee. So the first challenge, or the first... Uh, disruption that we had as a church family was trusting God. Trusting God. The next one was trying not to control everything, feeling scared of not being able to take care of my family. Go ahead, Lee. Isolation. Feeling separated from others was difficult. Another disruption. Loss. As a church family, we experienced loss. We lost family. We lost friends. We had a family that went through a house fire. Another disruption. Seeing family fear sickness that is already defeated was hard for someone. One more, Lee. Thank you. All right. Now, here is where we grew. Are you ready, Tess? All right. As a church, we did this. We learn perseverance. Go ahead, kiddo. We learn that we can still come together on Sundays even though we're not together. Sticking together? We grew in our hair length and our stomach size. Yeah, somebody gave that, put that in the answer. I like that one. We learned to reflect on what is important, such as church, family, and friendship. We learn to not have a spirit of fear, but of love. We learn how to be more patient when going out into public with people, how to love people. We learn how to put our trust and our faith in God. Thank you. Let's give them a hand. Thanks, kiddo. This is the goal when life is disrupted. It is to outweigh it with God's things and not the world's. Because we all know that there's people that are here in life right now. There's people that don't have God. They don't have the same resources that we have. They don't have that rock to go to. 
Disruptions, they come from decisions of, that other people make. We said that. And they can come from ourselves. But the key is, when we look at this disruption, and when we're in disruptions, to, an, to ask ourselves some questions. Don't waste your disruption. I want to tell you that. Don't waste your disruption. You will learn stuff in it if you push in. Disruptions are very easy, and you probably know people who have been so disrupted they don't know where to turn. It happens. But if you ask yourself some of these questions, like this one, and I'm going to give you examples from my life, but the first one is ask yourself what we can learn from this, or what can I learn from this? Sarah and I learned that we can spend prolonged periods of time together. It's one thing we learned. We learned that we are not ready for retirement. Now, really, Sarah said, I'm not ready for retirement is how that conversation really went, but we did learn that together. Next question. How can we grow from this other than our stomach and our hair? How can we grow from this? What I did, one of the things that I did is I, I really dug down and I looked at my habits and I tried to, to get rid of healthy or get rid of unhealthy habits and create some healthy habits. I spent more time in the Psalms than maybe I ever have before and I just found that richness in them. The next question is, what does this make possible? Okay, so life's disrupted. Can you change it? Can't change the disruption, but you can control yourself, right? So what does this make possible? One of the things as a church, we decided that it made possible that we could still have services, we could still have services online, and that we could do services online that ministered to people. And it gave us an opportunity to say, okay, what is, and that's why these cameras are up here today, because we found that our reach online, even though we were doing it, that we have the potential and we have the talent to do it better, to reach people with the gospel of Christ. Disruptions can cause us to think differently. They can challenge our thought process. Often they will help us to see things from a different angle. Think about Joseph. His different angle was he was looking out of a well. Totally disrupted. What is God teaching me? If you don't journal, I encourage you to write some stuff down. Regardless of the why, God is able to reach you and teach you in the disruption. Don't let the devil have the disruption. Don't do that. Don't just throw your hands up in the air and say, oh, here I am. I understand it's not easy and it's taking steps forward and it's moving forward. And lastly, the last question I have for you this morning is, how can I love others in disruption? You see, if we are hurting in the middle of a disruption, how are others hurting who don't have that relationship with Christ? Who don't have this, these friends, these brothers and sisters in Christ to lean on, to call? So how can we love them? How can we show the love of God to people that are in need? As we look at the disruptions of 2020 in this series, we're going to examine what the Bible says about it, because that's really all that matters. But we're going to hit on these topics. Life without choices. Life without each other. Life with fear and life in Christ. How do we come out of this year better than we went into it? Our plan, we had a lot of planning as a church this year going forward. Our last time meeting together was our annual business meeting. And we had hopes and we had dreams and we had good conversations. And then we were disrupted. That doesn't mean that we're going to stop. If anything, we've learned how to do things better. We've grown as a church. We've grown closer. Remember this, that God is bigger than the disruptions of life. That God is in the disruptions of life. And God will carry us through the disruptions of life. Worship team, as we close. You have your Bible, 2 Corinthians 4, 8 through 10. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body 
the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be revealed in our bodies. Church, that is my prayer for you. I pray that this message encourages you. I want to encourage you to use the disruption. Don't waste the disruption that you've been through. Don't let the devil have that. Use it for good. Use it for God. Stand with us as we, we worship together. I'm sorry. One of the reasons we worship together and we want this song at the end of the service is to send you out encouraged and blessed. So I encourage you to engage. Becca.
God, we thank you for this time together, God. God, I thank you that even though life may dis be disrupted, God, that you are there with us. That you'll help us get through those dis disruptions, God. God, I pray that as we work through the next few weeks in, in this series, that you will show us how we can grow, how we can be closer to you, God, in the middle of disruptions. God, we thank you for this. I bless the church in Jesus' name.